So I, didn't, I was completely flustered, and I said, I like your eyes, lotus eyes. So Prabhupada was sitting on his mat, and then he like threw himself over halfway onto the floor, and he said, oh, I'm an old fool. And I was so bewildered by his hu overwhelming humility that I just off offered my obeisances and left. There were many times that I kicked myself for leaving <laughs> his association. That was one of them. So that was another uh, instruction through the hard knocks process. And of course, Srila Prabhupada's letter was also very wonderful. He said that, um, I'm glad to know that you have experienced at least some of the bliss of Krishna consciousness. And uh, he said that Giriraj is the name of Govardhan Hill, where Krishna tends his cows. And sometimes devotees take stone from Govardhan Hill and worship it as Krishna. And uh, and he said, I, I, so I marked it in your presence when I met you, and I prayed to Krishna that this soul become aware of the importance of Krishna consciousness. So, uh, of course, at the time I'd only joined two, two and a half months. And like our family's name was Teton. And as far as we knew, we were the only Tetons in the whole world, and we were very proud of it. And uh, we identified with the Grand Teton Mountains, and we were very proud of it. So when Prabhupada gave me the name of a mountain, I was just astonished. I thought, he knows everything. He even knew I was proud of my mountain name. And he gave me another mountain name, just so I wouldn't be, feel I lost anything. So that was my initiation. So one morning, Srila Prabhupada wanted some orange juice. So there was no orange in Prabhupada's kitchen. So I went to the deity kitchen, devotee kitchen. There was no orange. So I had to go to the, to the, to the fruit shop, you know, to buy some oranges. And those days, you remember, like it was quite. There was nothing in front of our temple, so to get get the oranges, I had to go quite a distance, near the bus stop, bus station. And so when I came back with the oranges, and I started to make the orange juice. And the bell rang. Sri Prabhupada used to call us by ringing the bell. And so I ran to Srila Prabhupada's room. So Prabhupada asked me what happened to the orange juice. So I said, well, uh, Srila Prabhupada, I'm just getting it, you know. And then I went back and started to make the orange juice. And then, you know, it, take, it took me some time to make it. So the bell rang again. But this time, the bell just kept on ringing continuously, you know. Prabhupada just kept pressing the bell, you know. And just by the sound of the bell, I could understand, you know, how angry Srila Prabhupada must be. So, <clears throat> I uh, somehow, you know, finished making the orange juice, put it in Prabhupada's silver cup, and uh, took it on a silver plate and rushed into Prabhupada's room. But as I opened the door, you know, I heard something that sounded like a thunderbolt. And Prabhupada was just telling me, like, take it away, I don't want it. I don't want it, I'd get out of here. But, you know, I could not get out, <laughs> you know. Like, so with the uh, bowl in my, I mean, with the plate, with the gla glass of orange juice in my hands, I just kept on moving towards Srila Prabhupada. And I came to Srila Prabhupada and I held it in front of him. For some time, Srila Prabhupada didn't pick up the glass. And finally, Prabhupada picked it up <laughs> and he started to drink it. When he started to drink it, I remembered 
I realized that I forgot to bring the bowl of water that Prabhupada would need to wash his mouth after drinking the juice. So I ran to the kitchen, got the bowl of water, and then when Prabhupada was washing his mouth, uh, then I remembered that I forgot to bring the napkin for Prabhupada to wipe his face. So this time I didn't run to the kitchen, I just went to Prabhupada's wardrobe and pulled out a towel and <clears throat> uh, gave it to Srila Prabhupada. So then Prabhupada started to tell me, you are trying to serve me so nicely, but I always chastise you. You see, when one becomes old, one becomes short-tempered. So please don't mind. When Srila Prabhupada was chastising me, I didn't feel bad. But when Prabhupada started to speak like that, my heart just broke. And I tried to tell Prabhupada, please don't speak like that, Prabhupada. But, you know, my voice was choked. And then finally I... But Prabhupada continue, continuously speaking, you know, like in that note, you know, like how mm, when one becomes old, one becomes short-tempered. And then Prabhupada, I managed to speak up and I told Prabhupada, Prabhupada, please don't speak like that. I make mistakes and if, I, if you don't correct me, then what will happen to me? That's one of the instances I remember when, uh, when Srila Prabhupada chastised me very heavily. Regarding the getting inspiration from the so-called old masters, uh, I was concerned about that in 1968 um, because I knew I wasn't very talented and I was wondering if I should study. So I wrote to Prabhupada and he wrote back, that um, there's a story that the man who lives next to you in the house next to you speaks a different language. He's from another country. And his house one day is on fire. Now, you want to tell him to do something. If you take the time to learn his language, in the meantime, everything is finished. So somehow or other, express it. Like he told one story that in India, uh, the, a lot of Britishers were the owners of the shops and the Indian people worked for them. So one Britisher was out and it was a cloth shop and some monkeys came and messed everything up. So when the owner came back, the Indian worker couldn't speak English, so he just jumped up and down and said, monkey sir, monkey sir, monkey sir. So Prabhupada wanted to somehow, whatever we knew of the artistic language, express it because now it was an emergency. Prabhupada did not care to wait that we became talented. It was amazing to me because I knew that as Krishna's associate, even though we were young devotees, we knew the powers of the pure devotee. We had enough books and enough lectures to know the mystic powers and spiritual powers of a pure devotee. So I knew that he could have asked a demigod or gotten some big powerful person on the earth to, to paint for him. And yet he took us, who really had no talent, um, or extremely little. And on top of that, he wasn't interested in waiting until we got talented by many, many paintings before we started to work for his books. Even the Krishna book was 1960, early 69, and uh, he took us from, that was the first, our first attempt at our own compositions, and they were extremely crude, and still he wanted it done at that time. And you know that Prabhupada came when Krishna chose that particular time for him to come in those very historical, sociological 60s times. The whole thing was planned by Krishna. So there was some reason although I couldn't understand it, that Prabhupada didn't want to wait for us to become expert. In the course of the morning walks uh, in Los Angeles, I asked some other questions. Uh, I remember at Cheviot Hills, I asked um, that, we, that we 
preach that Krishna is the origin of everything. But sometimes people ask the question, what is the origin of Krishna? Srila Prabhupada replied that you tell them that as far as our information goes, Krishna is the origin. Uh, but if you have something or someone who's the origin of Krishna, we will worship that thing or that person. But until you find someone who's the origin of Krishna, then you worship Krishna as the origin of all 